All right, folks, Minmax Munchkin back with the first video in the 50 video challenge. So, yeah, today's order of business first and foremost, the Patreon shout outs Mike, Matthew, Ewing, Larry Hook, and Bartley Man hardly, hard, hardly trying. I cannot, I'm butchering it already. Rogue Wars, Suburban Hell, Frank Fan, Albert Quack, Aiden Hearth, Dark Sin, Gary Kors, Matthew Collins, Brad Oldham, Jared Henderson. Caleron, Joel C. Alcazar, Will Ketterer, Zachary Bradley, Rich Million, Re Jeremy Hilton, Brad Wynn, Ya Boy Fox, Brian Moten, Sean, Corey Williams, <gasps> Breathe, Chris Pell, Manozzi Stefano, Clea Decoya, CI6658, Troy Cal, Spiffe, Primal Bass Boost, thank you all the new Patreon patrons supporting me all this time. I will make sure to repay uh, some of that service back through new videos, through interesting content and through videos like this one so with that said I tried actually making this video like two and a half three hours ago it ended up being two hours long I don't know how I even managed to talk about fighter for two hours but I did manage it and thinking back at it I was like yeah no I'm gonna try it again and uh, this time around I'm gunning for less than an hour video because like you know it's ridiculous how do you make a two hour video about a fighter I don't know I, it's, I did it, so let's try not to do it again. So yeah, first and foremost, fi fighter, like as a basic features of fighter, it, class as a whole is like quite front, front loaded, which is why one to three levels in fighter is one of the most popular multi-classing dips. Fighters only get a handful of unique basic class features, but these features get incrementally better and better with higher levels. So actually, let's take a closer look. Fighting style. Um, the only martial class which gets to choose amongst all six dis dis distinct uh, official fighting styles is fighter. Uh, fighters can really be made into any type of weapon wielder, um, any type you want. There are other unofficial fighting styles which have been released some time ago in Unearthed Arcana. But I'm not gonna be talking about those in this video. This is most. This is this is going going to be like official class only videos. So yeah, I'm gonna be sticking with those. Um, archery overall is, in my opinion, is the best one um, because uh, you know, like it's a plus two bonus to attack rolls. Nothing. No other fighting style offers you a bonus to accuracy to the same extent that archery does, right? So it's pretty much like the only fighting style that does that anyway. Defense is pretty much, in my opinion, right after, especially because most campaigns are played and finished on uh, lower levels and monsters attacks bonuses are still kind of like on the lower end um, in, in, the, in those like lower level campaigns, lower level sessions. Dueling is actually amazing on first couple levels because you know monster hit points inflates really fast as you level up at level one like uh, seven hit points goblin or a five hit points uh, kobold can easily die if you pick this style uh, But just like as you keep leveling up you get into the 15 10s 20s 30 hit points Yeah, the fighting style rapidly diminishes as you keep leveling up um, still fighters are one of the best class to take this fighting style because no other martial class gets as many attacks per turn per round as fighters. So with just sheer amount of attacks that you get, dueling fighting style is pretty much gonna be... You as a fighter are gonna be benefiting the most out of the fighting style as it is. So, um, protection is actually situational in my opinion. Um, it's, uh, it's... Kind of like, a lot of people like it, but uh, it's a bit confined, <laughs> no pun intended, for tight corridors, small rooms and dungeons where your squishy characters, your wizards, sorcerers and other casters who are not really in there to take damage, they're just like to dish damage. Um, they don't have the privilege of, uh, you know, hurling their ranged attacks and spells from safe distance. They are pretty much confined to like 15 by 15, 30 by 30 rooms. And in such like chaotic scenarios, they are they can easily get targeted by enemies' attacks just as you can. So in this particular case, protection can be really good. However, like when you're fighting at like in 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 uh, 
I don't know, um, open spaces, forests and stuff like that. Like protection is kind of like really, eh, whatever. Like it doesn't really come up that often. So it's uh, it's a bit of a like a pros and cons with this protection, with this fighting style. Two weapon fighting, uh, well, first and foremost, great weapon fighting. I think is uh, on average like on average statistically it's worse than dueling because it only increases your damage by like around one depending on the weapon type uh, that you're wielding but in a, in a typical session where you have only a handful of damage rolls let's say you have like 20 attack rolls and then you miss some of them and like you have 10 to 15 damage rolls the the sample size is really low the statistical significance goes out of the window and the only thing you care about is re-rolling those ones and twos um, and when you have like when you have the privilege of re-rolling a one and then it lands on like 10 or even 12 yeah like you don't really care about statistics and uh, I've had the recent I've had the opportunity to recently actually using this style and it literally happened just as I described it and it felt amazing so just for that like low sample size like swingy type of impact that this fighting style can have I think it's leaps and bounds about two weapon fighting which I would consider objectively the worst style though it can still be it can still be made somewhat viable Especially when you stack the fighting style you get from fighter, uh, which obviously we are talking about, two weapon fighting. Um, when you stack it with features and spells on top, primarily multi-classing, for example, into Paladin or Barbarian or something, you know, like where you can get additional damage on top of your ordinary weapon damage. Uh, it strictly does less damage than dueling. Uh, doesn't synergize with your many extra attacks that you get and your AC is just lower Because well, you're wielding a weapon in your offhand. You don't really have shield to protect yourself You just you, you go in with like weapon swinging and Not really that uh, not really that protected against counterattacks and you know enemies hitting you back So yeah, that's basically how I see the fighting styles um, It's kind of like um, more geared toward, towards fighter only i'm not gonna say the dueling is as good as as it is on fighters like on paladin paladin speaking dueling is strictly worse than fighter speaking dueling because fighters get like many attacks um you know like depending on these subclasses and other stuff like some of these fighting styles obviously come a bit better than they would be out of like you know in isolation in wake in vacuum so we are going to be talking about that uh, more uh, real soon. Um, second wind, like a level, level, like level one feature as well, which you get at level one, is really amazing at level one, because you roll one d10 plus your fighter level, which is like a bonus action heal. That's pretty much all you need. If that one d10 ends on like uh, on a, on a bit like higher uh, end of the curve. So pretty much like if you roll 6 or 7 or something, you pretty much um, heal yourself for almost your full hit points, sometimes even your full hit points. However, unfortunately, as despite it being really, really good early on, this feature quickly loses potency at higher levels. Uh, but, you know, like, even then, like, extra healing is always useful in a pinch and helps al al alleviate some of the strain of the clerics, druids and bards that are, you know, struggling to, to keep you all up uh, and uh, fighting. So, now that we go to Action Surge, which is one of the main reasons why a two-level fighter dip is so popular with so many builds. Um, this feature alone allows you one extra action per short rest, and you only need two levels of fighter to get it. Uh, you can attack again, you can cast a second spell, Yes, two fireballs are perfectly legal. Don't let anybody tell you it's not, because that only works with bonus action spells. We are strictly talking about actions here. So action surge gives you another action. Doesn't have anything to do with bonus action or anything else. Uh, the only thing you get is additional action. That's why it's called like it's called. You can dash, you can disengage, you can try to hide, you can attack again. Um, and uh, if you're if you're in a sufficiently high level game, 
and your character is sufficiently high level, you can potentially, like in the first two rounds of combat, have more total attack rolls than all other players in your party, all your companions. That's, that's some food for thought. Uh, I'm not going to go into the martial archetypes right away, uh, but I'm going to just quickly mention the ability score improvements. Fighters get 7 of these. Uh, rogues are the only class that gets more than 5. Every other class, official class at this present time, at this present moment. Wizard, Warlock, Sorcerer, Ranger, Paladin, Monk, Druid, Cleric, Bard and Barbarian. All of those classes get only 5 ability score increases. Improvements. Um, and, like, this does help put fighters on somewhat even playing field compared to other martial classes. For example, barbar barbarians get rage, that helps immensely on low levels to, like, increase survivability and increase damage. Um, paladins get self-heal and later on aura of protection. R even rogues, which are not typical marshals, they don't have, like, extra attack and somewhat, like, they don't even have fighting styles and stuff like that. Um, but it, like they are weapon wielders, weapon users, even rogues get sneak attack and cunning action and stuff like that. So you can really customize and uh, build up your fighter through these ability score improvements um, and you get seven of them once again. So yeah, most tables allow feats and feats are amazing and even if, the, if your table doesn't allow feats, just the sheer fact that you can bump up your strength to 20 increase your con to 20 or maybe if you're a dex user bump up your dex to 20 and then keep like bumping wisdom or even intelligence or charisma whatever you want um yeah it's really really neat finally well not finally but like after all after like four levels of excruciating ground grind we finally get to level five and that's like extra attack so just like every other martial class fighters get extra attack at level five but they also get one extra attack at level 11 and also at level 20 they get the fourth attack. So this makes fighters one of the most reliable single target DPR classes out there. And at higher levels you will rarely ever spend a turn dealing zero damage. Something that for example rogues are notorious for because they only get one maybe two attacks in a, in a, in a single turn. And you, you have a privilege of just swinging for fences for days. Uh, depending on your level, right? Um, now, Indomitable is a fairly higher level feature, but at the level that you get it, at the, at the level that you get your first use, at level 9, is uh, just at the time we are succeeding on saving throws starts becoming more and more important than, you know, just relying on your AC and not getting hit. Of course, just like most other features of Fighter, which we just like briefly touched upon, you get more uses at higher levels and this is pretty much the theme of like basic features of fighter because you only get like three or four basic type of features and the only thing that you get at higher levels is those features you get more uses of them um for example extra attack you get one more at level 11 indomitable you get one more at level 13 um you get one more use of action surge at level 17 so it's kind of like the theme of uh, of, of fighter and it might sound kind of like boring, bland and straightforward at, at the beginning, but all of these features are really good. And when you combine them with martial archetype features, which we are gonna delve uh, just like in, in a moment, it really makes the fighter into one of the pri prime classes like... Uh, parties that don't have fighters or pretty much any other martial in, in them, they really struggle. I've recently had the opportunity to play in a session that pretty much had all spellcasters. No, there was no martial, there was no single target damage dealing class in there. And we spent like eight rounds trying to dwindle like the hit points of like a random ass demon we were fighting. It was really painful. I really wished like one of the fighters one in the, was in that session, but unfortunately there wasn't so... Yeah, when you have them, you kind of like feel, what is this guy doing? He's just hitting stuff. But when you don't have him in a party, oh boy, like, his, his, like, his presence is felt and his absence is felt even more. So with that said, let's go into the Arcane Archer real quick. Um, I like the theme of this subclass, but frankly, 
it's one of the weaker subclasses of all the archer subclasses, martial archetypes. Um, it's not bad, it's just not that good either. It's kind of like in the middle, mediocre, a bit better than mediocre, but still leaves a lot to be desired for. Um, it does restrict you to use only two weapons, um, but on the other hand, like what's bad about using a short or long bow to shoot weapons from, uh, to shoot enemies from safe distance, right? So, first and foremost, we get this Arcane Archer lore. It's more mostly like a ribbon feature. It helps, it helps like, um, uh, it helps you build that feeling of, yes, I'm an actual fighter that can do some limited rudimentary form of magic. You get a couple of these cantrips, um, you get a couple of skills. Uh, well, one skill or one of these cantrips, wh whichever one you choose, it's kind of like good. I would probably go for press digitation, but Druidcraft is interesting because you can predict weather uh, easily with this cantrip and it kind of forces your DM to be prepared with like, oh, what type of weather is it today? Well, it's kind of rainy and then tomorrow, you know, well, it's kind of sunny. Well, why was it sunny? Because it's rainy. You know, like, you, 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 can, you can have some fun with this cantrip. But anyway, um, Arcane Shot is actually where, it, where the fun really begins. And this is actually the feature that makes and then breaks the class. Basically, you learn a couple of these magic arrow tricks which you can perform twice per short rest. And most of these magic tricks deal 2d6 extra damage. Which is really good at level 3 when you get the feature. However, as you keep leveling up, you only learn more tricks. But these tricks, these tricks don't improve in power. Um, they just, you, you learn more of them. And yes, you can increase the potency of these tricks, these shots, whatever you want to call them, uh, by investing in intelligence, but that's where the problems arise. That's what makes you even more dependent on multiple abilities. This is kind of like where you water down the subclass, because something that even, even like as many ability score improvements as fighters get, even 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 you can't keep up with 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 how many abilities you have to keep track of you have you have to keep bumping your your dexterity because you're shooting uh your bows you have to keep bumping your intelligence because you need it for these tricks and then on top of that you also need some constitution because you know like you're a fighter you're expected from time to time to, to tank some shots um and yeah, it really puts you in this very weird position where you have to keep simultaneously bumping three ability scores and that's not that's easier said than done. But if if we just ignore all of that, um you you get a couple of these very interesting uh options, arcane shot options. So first and foremost on low levels, bursting arrow gives you like AoE damage, which on a level that you get is really good, but later on loses potency because 2d6 damage is not that, that good at, 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 at later levels. However, uh, Grasping Arrow is, in my opinion, um, probably the most useful, most consistent one of all because it's the only option that whose extra features are not reliant on a creature failing its saving throw. Now, you deal that extra damage. Uh, sure, it's a poison type of damage, so it might get resisted, it might be immune, but at later levels you don't really care that much about dealing as much damage, even though, well, you kind of do. But this effect which Grasping Arrow provides is like, it's immediate. There's no saving throw against it, the creature immediately, its speed gets reduced, it gets tangled in these roots, poisonous brambles, whatever, and if it wants to get away from those, it has to spend its action. So... Yeah, I mean, this does affect your own action economy in a very beneficial manner and affects the enemy's action economy in a very, you know, bad manner. So, I think for that reason, Grasping Arrow is really good. And finally, in my opinion, Banishing Arrow is something that you should consider when you play this class because, you know, if you decide to pump, especially if you decide to pump up your save DC, if you increase your intelligence up to 20, if you max it out, I mean, you can deny a powerful monster's turn by banishing it for the time being, or if it's a boss, some kind of like super awesome creature with legendary saves, you betcha that creature is gonna use one of those legendary saves. So, yeah, all of this like 
all of this fig feels really weak when you realize that the damage of these options does not increase before level 18. In other words, when you get to level 10 or like something, uh, the only thing you have to rely on is like these effects. Because the damage on its own is not going to be that effective. Uh, and uh, yeah, these effects are powerful, but they go off of intelligence. So multiple ability dependency is something that's kind of like really bad. Um, when you go single class, you kind of expect, okay, I'm only going to be focusing on two abilities. But somehow with this subclass, you have to focus on three, even though you're not even multiclassing. So yeah, in my homebrew campaign, I've actually decided to buff the features of, uh, of this particular feature. I gave it one more damage at level 10, one more die, one more damage die at level 10. Uh, nobody in my home group or my online players plays Arcane Archer, so I don't really know whether that's even that important, that impactful. But I don't think this class would break or become OP if... If it was given just like one more arcane, one more use of arcane shot at let's say level 10, I don't think that would break the class. But as it is, that this is what we are operating with and that's what we have to work with. So yeah, um, if your DM allows you otherwise, good. If not, this is what you have. So yeah, let's explore. Magic arrow at level 7. It's always good that a uh, class gives you magic, magic weapon, magic like uh, damage. Because in some cases, in some campaigns with some DMs, you just cannot rely on them uh, to, of giving you like weapons that you want. Like in this particular instance, you're limited to, uh, to a short and long bow. So it just might not happen that for the entirety of the campaign, um, it just might happen that you don't get the weapon. You don't get a magical long bow or short bow. So in that case... I kind of like it makes sense to give the class magic magic arrows. Also, curving shot is pretty straightforward on its own. I actually had the privilege of playing in a party with a single class arcane archer, and the amount of times curving shot turned a missed attack roll into a hit was was amazing. On the other hand, there are more reliable ways to get a bonus action attack, but at least you don't have to rely so much on feats in this particular instance. You kind of get a pseudo bonus action attack. Because you, you, frankly, you cannot really afford of taking too many feats. You have to keep like bumping your intelligence and dexterity uh, as you keep leveling up. So, yeah, there's that. Um, more, more options, more tricks as you keep leveling up. Finally, at level 15, you kind of like while. Okay, so you when you get this feature, you always have at least one use of arcane shot. That sounds cool on paper, in theory, but at level 15 it hardly even matters. Um, it, har it hardly ever matters, right? So on top of that, I have yet to come across a high level table which can manage to have like 4 to 6 encounters as recommended by Dungeon Master's Guide. In my own experience, high level parties can pull off 1, maybe 2 combat encounters during the course of a single session, anything more than that turns into a 15 hour long slugfest and if you have a DM who can manage high level combats that last less than I'm gonna say a conservative 2 hour it's yeah that DM is a goddamn superstar and uh, yeah finally uh, at uh, level 18 you get one more trick and that's it that's it for the arcane archer um, and finally after we've gone through all of that pain, which is not like, I'm not gonna say again that it's a bad class, but you're gonna quickly see why it's not that good either. Uh, the case in point is Battlemaster. It's still considered by many people as the best fighter subclass out there. I dare and say that Eldritch Knight, particularly late level Eldritch Knight, and to some extent Cavalier, can easily kind of like outshine, outperform uh, Battlemaster, but it mostly depends on your party and your DM and the campaign that you're in. I just, I won't even compare apples to cucumbers, so as it stands with Battlemaster, uh, uh, a class that has been out ever since 5th edition uh, became a thing, you can still annoy your DM just as well as you could you know, back w back when it was like a new new thing, a new shiny toy in people's uh, on people's sheets. So first and foremost, you get the Student of War, which is a ribbon feature. 
that helps flesh out your character into something more refined than just a dumb brute hitting stuff hard and fast. Uh, but combat superior superiority and maneuvers is the you know that's that's where the that's where the meat of this class is. Uh, right off the bat at level three, you get three maneuvers, four d8 superiority die that recharge at short rest, more dice, more maneuvers at level seven, uh, ten, and fifteen. An option to swap maneuvers every time you learn a new one, uh, and most importantly, saving throws for some of these uh, maneuvers that actually go off of your attack ability, right? Instead of going off of intelligence or whatever other mental ability um, that Arcane Archer goes off. So strength or dex is pretty much the, the only two abilities that fighters are even interested in, uh, depending on whether you go dex or strength. Either one of those will work and simultaneously increase the save DC for the maneuvers. So, uh, yeah, that's the only, that's only a good thing because, like, you don't have to even worry about multiple abilities. You only have to worry about one. Possibilities are endless. Uh, here are just a few maneuvers to paint a picture. For example, disarming attack, uh, which can be used to thoroughly mess up enemy spellcasters by just knocking out their uh, arcane focuses, arcane foci, foci, how do you even say that? I don't know. Um, for example, if you're not sure whether your attack roll hits, you roll like 13, 14, you're not really sure if that's enough. Well, you have precision and uh, you add that, uh, add that to your attack roll and you just laugh as you see the monster bleed more and more. Um, and maybe, maybe you just need advantage on the next attack roll. Uh, fear not, there's trip attack and then there's also fainting attack. Those two can easily give you advantage in one way or another, or even like trip attack, you provide advantage to your allies. So with so many maneuvers at your disposal, with so many combinations of these maneuvers that you can learn and use, you can really flesh out your battle master the way you want it, and you can legitimately become a martial battlefield control god. Uh, and don't forget, you still deal that sweet, sweet extra damage most of these maneuvers, allow you to add the number you rolled on the combat superiority die uh, to the damage of the attack. So this quickly like stacks up real fast and uh, yeah you can really like you can really stack up damage uh, on, on top of each other. So yeah like this this feature becomes better and better as you keep leveling up. It increases in power, it increases in versatility, it increases in the amount of options that you can have at your disposal. Everything that battle that Arcane Archer does, Battlemaster can almost do the same or better. Pretty much like better in a way that like power, damage, or like even just versatility. So yeah, like this class is pretty much like superior in almost every way. But uh, let's let's look at one other way that this class can be even more broken. So. Particularly know your enemy um, is kind of like a bit of a meta gamey feature because you know you know you you get to know some of the st stats from the monster's stat block or any creature's stat block. Um, so meta gaming is one of those evergreen accusations that gets flung across D and D tables for ages, for years now, for decades, uh, and through online virtual tabletops and Discord servers. But what if you could actually legitimately gain knowledge? about at least some of those uh, statistics, some of those abilities. I mean, with Know Your Enemy, Battlemaster certainly allows you to do that. And not to mention that the feature doesn't really specify that you can only do it once. If you can get yourself in a position that you can do it like you can observe the creature for several minutes, you know, you can figure out more than just two of these things. Um, and now, granted, this feature is quite situational, but I can easily imagine scenarios where sneaking up and observing the monster you're about to engage in combat can provide useful meta knowledge. And the two numbers I'd be the most interested in is are clearly like current hit points and armor classes. Those two features, those two stati statistics, are the ones that are most like generally uh, relevant to every party member that you're currently in with. So it can really pay off to know in advance how hard will it be to hit the creature or how long it can withstand taking damage. 
um, it's not like you know w once you get to know those things you will be operating in complete like control okay we only need like to do this this and that um, and uh, yeah like it's I think it's really good like it's situational but when the situation arises no other subclass no other class can do it as well well maybe like monster slayer ranger but that's about it you know and battlemaster still does it better um obviously improved combat superiority your dice become more powerful uh one more reason why arcane archer is uh, a thorn in my eye um why couldn't arcane archer's dice become you know instead of dealing 2d6 at level 10 he deals 3d6 damage or instead of dealing 1d6 damage he deals 2 he deals 2d6 damage it wouldn't break the game um but yeah anyway uh, relentless at level 15 uh, you roll initiative you always have at least one superiority die now granted I kind of like shut over the feature of uh, arcane archer so I'm not gonna pretend here and say that this is a good feature but with so many goodies at earlier levels it's kind of like fair that you get one dud um, and it's not really a dud it's just like meh at level 15 one more superiority die you already have I think you already have six of them at this point so why do you even care about one more you pretty much don't uh, and finally at level 18 your dice become from a d10 superiority they become a d12 which like minimizes odds of rolling ones and twos um, yeah like it's more stable more consistent um, it doesn't really make that much of a difference in terms of damage output and uh, all of that other stuff but uh, with some of those maneuvers particularly precision it can really like if you roll 12 on top of your like plus 10 or whatever your modifier is pl plus 12 like you can have plus 24 to hit with like any given attack roll that's that's just broken um it's not broken but yeah it gets into a territory of like of your dm getting frustrated and not knowing how to challenge you if he you know if he's if he is not really really that accustomed to the system but yeah, anyway, uh, that's it for Battlemaster. I think it's really good. I think you should, if you play a fighter and you've never played fighter before, like you're not going to fail with Battlemaster. It might not be the most damaging. It's not going to have any spells. It's kind of like, a, but it does offer you that uh, like feel for, okay, I have options. I have to get into this class uh, to get the most out of it. Because like, if you can see, there's a lot of these maneuvers and it's easy to kind of like, not 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 know which one to take first which one to take later but with most of these you will you will be golden like most of these work just just fine so uh yeah basically that's it for the battlemaster uh, cavalier cavalier i think just like you know wh while battlemaster excels in excels in terms of versatility and sheer amount of possibilities um Cavalier stands out with its raw action economy and uh, damage potential. And every time I read into this subclass, into this martial archetype, um, I get more and more convinced that you don't really even need feats when you pick Cavalier. All you need is just pump your strength, pump your con, because these like these super good features work off of those those abilities. And these features are basically like feats, you know, so um, they are that good. So, yeah, that's pretty much like th the way I see it, at least in this present time. So, yeah, at level 3 you get like bonus proficiencies. That's cool, like skills are cool. Makes sense that you are proficient in animal handling because you are a cavalier. So it's kind of expected for you to have a horse or some other mount, right? You're not required to, to have a mount, but I mean... It kind of goes with uh, goes with the theme of the class, right? Um, and also, like that's that's another thing. You're not required to use. You're not required to be on the mount to use any of these features, other than born to the saddle, obviously being only relevant to you mounting, dismounting, you know, like falling off of your mount and other stuff, like giving you a lot of uh, benefits uh, in, in those areas. Uh, so yeah, basically Unwavering Mark is where uh, the level 3 juice begins and it's uh, There's a lot of juice to squeeze with this feature uh, Whenever we actually talk about tanks in D&D, we are primarily talking about characters that can absorb a lot of damage damage sponges however 
A true meaning of a tank is not only being able to absorb and mitigate uh, damage, it's actually to draw fire on himself or herself, force the enemy into attacking him or her instead of the squishies in the back. So while Cavalier can mitigate damage, you know, decently as well as any other fighter out there, uh, the subclass, the level 3 feature, excels, and not just the level 3, all the other features, uh, they kind of excel with this rare but potent uh, combo of features that result in these like pseudo agro aggro mechanics. So, while enemy doesn't really have to attack you when you use these features, you are severely uh, disincentivizing the enemy from attacking anybody else other than you. And that's kind of what you want to do when you're a tank, right? Uh, so when you mark a creature you hit, um, w w when you get to level 3 and you have this feature on Wavering Mark, it has a disadvantage against everybody and everything else other than you. Uh, if it still decides to hurt somebody else, you can now use your bonus action to swing with advantage and deal even more damage than you would normally do with your like normal attack. Uh, it is a long rest dependent feature, but it's also kind of like limited by your strength, not kind of, but it is. Uh, but with how good it is, like considering how good it is for a level 3 feature, I think it should be a long rest feature. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for it to be and remain so, uh, e even though like... Even though if you say like fighters, fighter features should be short rest, no, 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 like this feature is legitimately very, very good. Um, so, warding maneuver, you get it at level 7, uh, so it's just 4 levels after you get your first very, very good feature. And now, at level 7, uh, you now get another way to protect yourself and those nearby. And you stick out like a sore thumb, you're, you're really annoying your enemies, and probably your DM at this point. Uh, because with this special type of reaction that you get when you get to level 7, um, you or any creature close to you, including your mount, can either force uh, the attack roll that hits to miss, or if the attack still hits after you roll this 1d8 and add it to the AC, um, it only deals half damage, so like if the attack deals 20, 30, 40 damage, which could could even happen at level 7, but especially later on when you get to higher levels, this feature becomes ridiculous, because sure, uh, the monster might just have like plus 16 million to hit and hits you regardless of rolling a d8 or not, but that hits only deals half damage, and this is, uh, yeah, I mean... This is really, really good. Um, now, now, granted, this feature also imposes a daily limit uh, that's limited with your constitution modifier, but that goes to my first point about this class, where I think, like, you don't need feats. All you need to do with your ability score improvements, bump up your constitution, bump up your strength, you're golden. And um, if you've done half a job at optimizing your character, like at level 7, you will have at least 16 constitution anyway. So three uses of this feature, they are more than enough when dealing with those massive enemies that deal crap ton of damage on, uh, you know, conveniently random. And I'm making quotation marks in real life right now, so I feel like an idiot. Um, random critical hit that the DM didn't fudge at all, like not at all, like he just randomly roll that crit in a very convenient moment um so yeah that's that's gonna help against those those moments hold the line level 10 feature again like this class gets something good at every level uh basically when you read into the feature and think about it for a minute or two when an enemy enters your reach and you manage to hit it its speed becomes zero regardless uh, as long as you have a reaction to spare you are like that enemy is hard pressed to, to, to move out of your reach. Uh, and this is just one more tool that forces enemies to focus you instead of the squishies in the back. Because, you know, if they want to move within your reach, especially if you take a reach weapon, right? So the enemy has like 5 feet reach, but you have 10 feet reach. And the enemy tr uh, tr uh, tries to get in melee with you, and then you use this reaction. Well, now the enemy doesn't have any choice, it has to fight you 
because there's no other targets in in immediate vicinity and that's what tank does you know like yeah you kind of you're there to take damage but also you're there to prevent enemies from damaging your more fragile companions and yeah with all of these features so far you're doing exactly what tank is supposed to do so at level 15 ferocious ferocious charger doesn't actually look that impressive as a standalone level 15 feature but when you combine it with everything else you can do with all of these you know stop the enemy give it zero movement speed give it more damage um gain advantage here whatever yeah like it's everything else that you can do your dm will quickly run out of excuses why he she still chucks rocks at that wizard trying to get cover behind the big tree um like there's there's like very little way for that to work out and um at, by this level like the dm is pretty much just gonna be targeting you because you're gonna leave him very little wiggle room or leave her to attack anybody else so yeah there's that finally at level 18 you get the i mean look uh I want to say right away that this feature is highly situational and therefore won't always proc, but goddamn, can you find me any other subclass that can theoretically do more than 30 attacks in one round and single-handedly stop an entire horde of enemies trying to pass by it through a tight corridor? Uh, think about it, you stand in the middle of the hallway. You wield the glaive or some other reach weapon. All your enemies are moving into your reach. They're trying to, to get past you. But due to your hold the line level 10 feature. Combining synergizing with vigilant defender. Uh, wow. Yeah. Now you can do like you can do unlimited reactions. As long as like every enemy has its own turn. And that's how 5th edition D&D works. Every creature has its own turn. Well, on their turns, you can have like this opportunity attacks. And if they try to go like move within your reach, hold the line gives you a special type of opportunity attack. So when that happens, bro, you, you, you literally single-handedly stop an entire horde. That's just amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, after all of this amazing stuff with Battlemaster and Cavalier, we get to the freaking champion, which... Uh, you know, honestly, when I think about champion, I immediately think about just three levels champion and like X levels in Paladin or bar Barbarian or any, or any other class for that matter. I can't ever imagine playing like single class champion past level three or at, at, at the most level five, maybe six. Past that, nah, it's literally... Why? Why would you even bother? Yeah, I mean, it's really that bad. Uh, so let's delve into a cesspool of mediocrity. At level 3, you get, you get critical hits at 19 and 20. Um, that's it. Um, think about it. Arcane Archer can pretty much decide, okay, I'll deal more damage with this attack by using Arcane Shot option. And uh, Battlemaster uh, can also apply one of his maneuvers. Boom, more damage and also extra effect. Both Arcane Archer and Battlemaster. Cavalier doesn't have that much of a fine control over how and when his bonus attacks and extra damage gets applied. But at the very least, Cavalier can significantly diminish enemy's danger level and force the enemy to target him, the Cavalier, exclusively. Champion lands a few more critical hits here and there. And it's entirely determined by luck and randomness. And you have no control over how this feature gets applied. It just happens on its own and then it doesn't happen because, you know, numbers, they don't align. And you roll a die and that then it's just luck. Yeah, I mean, this is stupid. Other than, level th other than combining it with some other classes who deal ridiculous damage. Like what, you roll one more damage die randomly? Like you don't even get to decide when to roll one more damage die? Why would you even bother with this class? It's stupid. Um, but yeah, let's continue. Remarkable uh, athlete, uh, adding half of your rounded up proficiency bonus to your strength, dex, or con checks. Th this would actually be amazing. 
if you could actually use it in conjunction in um, in in a combination in like in a in a synergistic meaningful way with any other features that you get from this class but you, uh, you sadly you can't um you still swing or shoot your weapon the same way with a bit higher initiative or a bit lower initiative so why would you even care um being a bit better in dex based skill does helps uh, skills does help but i mean why would you even care about stealthing or sleight of hand or acrobatics uh, i don't know and there's also only one strength skill anyway athletics and i honestly can't remember the last time i heard any dm tell me roll a con check for that um i don't re i've i literally don't remember when i rolled a con check the only thing i rolled that's related to constitution is con saves and that's not the same thing so yeah pretty actually pretty underwhelming uh in 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 in, in terms of like this whole class um at level 10 you get additional fighting style I and mean, who cares you kind of like you get a bit more versatile in the way you can fight but you still kind of like swing your weapon and then randomly roll one more damage die here and there because you, you with, with zero control over when or how it happens whatever yeah let's just skip because this this is forgettable like you don't even have like who cares right um at level 15 superior critical boohoo you grind 15 levels into this stupid fucking class to be able to randomly roll one more damage five more time five five percent more time compared to before so now you have 15 percent chance of landing a critical hit so yeah it's gonna happen a little bit more often and you're still gonna have zero control of when it happens or how it happens it's just gonna happen a bit more frequently again zero control and zero synergy between any of these features we've just we've just explored cavalier and we've seen how all of his features from level 3 to level 18 synergize with each other and then you compare it with this stupid class which doesn't have any synergy in like with any of its features they're just standalone features they're not really working together in any conjunction combination or synergy and then finally at level 18 you get survivor which on its own i'm not gonna lie is actually a legitimately something that i can get behind because it's actually a very good feature so even though it's a level 18 feature that could have easily be swapped for level 15 because who the fuck cares about superior critical at level 15 uh the one you know like uh, it's it i still think it's viable even at this late of a level but again if only we could pair it with something else so it can synergize i mean really champion fighter is just a haphazard collection of standalone features that have no synergy with each other period it's just you get stuff as you level up that's it the most basic stupid boring rudimentary stuff you can get yeah that's champion sad really sad um but let's move on to the greener pastures eldritch knight i recently played the level 7 variant human eldritch knight and i was just as you know i was satisfied i i i thought it was gonna be and like like i thought it was gonna be like something and it really was you know it was very good I'm not gonna say that like I would have the same experience playing a lower level Eldritch Knight, but at level 7, um, it really felt, it felt nice. Um, so, yeah, uh, I had the Holy Trinity of Feats, a Great Weapon Master, a, a Polar Master and Sentinel. My familiar, my like, the, the familiar that I got with the spell, because you know Eldritch Knights can cast spells. Um, it was super useful at stealing blankets from other people's homes. We didn't manage to capture the runaway chickens in said stolen blankets, but I still landed seven attacks in a single round, killing three giant chickens. So no wonder a peasant was willing to pay a gold piece per each chicken that we retrieve, and there were a hundred of them. So, yeah, those were some big ass chickens. But anyway. Uh, spell casting and b and weapon bond as an eldritch knight you're basically one-third caster 
uh, like a light wizard, largely, largely limited to only abjuration and evocation spells, but in all honesty, that's hardly detrimental, because shield and absorb elements are on wizard's list, and those are like uh, two best trump card first level spells in the game anyway. They are good at level 1, they are good at level 3, they are good at level 10, they are good at level 20. Every time you get to use these spells, something good happens. And um, yeah, one thing that you should be mindful of with this class though, is that, um, you know, only, only as long as your DM is a bit of a stickler for rules like me, but is the fact that you do not gain the benefit of uh, being able to wield arcane focus, so, this can be easily overcome by, you know, buying Ruby of the War Mage, which is a common magic item, like, for, like, 50 gold or something, if your DM allows you to buy stuff from magic shops. Um, but, yeah, this item effectively turns any of your weapons that you put it in, uh, in, a, in, in a focus. And uh, if you don't have access to any of that, most spells you are gonna be relying on don't really require anything but verbal and or somatic components anyway, so it's not going to be that much of a problem in either case. Uh, and for everything else, there's this thing called component pouch. It actually exists. Yeah, I know, weird, right? So, yeah, whenever you need to cast spells that require components other than somatic on and vocal actual material components, just buy a pouch and put stuff in it. And, uh, yeah, be an actual adventurer with, like, stuff in your pockets and stuff. You're not just, like, relying on abstract staffs and wands and orbs to do magic. Um, I'm not gonna delve into the spell selection for Eldritch Knights, because that would take uh, probably one, one and a half hours, uh, and I don't want to do that. So, a more detailed overview of best spell choices for Eldritch Knight will be in one of the next few videos, as I do have, uh, I, I plan on releasing uh, an Eldritch Knight build. Uh, so stay tuned for that, because it's coming up real soon, maybe even in, in the next couple of days, because, you know, every day there's gonna be a new video for the next 50 days. So, there's that. A feature that often gets somewhat overlooked is a weapon bond, which allows you to make these, like, this special bond with not just one, but two weapons. Why is this important? What I like to do, what I like to imagine my Eldritch Knight doing, is have my main weapon and a dagger bonded to me. That way, if I ever get captured, I can just summon the dagger right into my hand, because it states so very unambiguously, very clearly in the feature, the weapon appears in your hand. Um, and then, uh, you know, if I get knocked out or if I get captured, I can just easily, you know, like, uh, uh, free myself and then I can, you know, help my allies free them with the dagger that I just magically summoned in my hand. Or if I get knocked out and lose the weapon in a mud hole and then I, I'm like about to get eaten by a savage monster... In the in the in the swamp, I can still have a better chance of fighting the monster, defending myself uh, with a weapon in my hand, instead of that weapon being lost somewhere in the mud, like 500 feet away from me. And not to mention, when you go to places that ask you to leave your weapons for your own safety, right? For our and your your safety, and then those places, the people inside of those places turn around, try to rob, kidnap, and kill you. Uh, for whatever reason, because, you know, that's what happens in D&D. Yeah, in that case, as well, weapon bond, weapon bond is a savior, because you can just give the weapon to whoever is guarding it, and bonus action, summon the weapon in your hand, and now you're ready for a fight. So, yeah, I mean, this, this feature in, like, a proper campaign, where, like, there's a little bit of combat, social encounters, exploration really comes up, I, I, I'd imagine this, this would come up very, very often. So, uh, yeah, that's it, and I really like it. Uh, and uh, I didn't get the chance to use it, but, I mean, if I ever play Eldritch Knight again, which I am gonna, um, I'm gonna probably get the opportunity to use it in one way or another. Uh, level 7 feature of War Magic is really good, in my own opinion, more, like, more useful for melee-oriented Eldritch Knights, as you can pair your cantrip, which you cast, let's say you cast Firebolt, 
or chill touch or any other cantrip that has like decent amount of range um, and then you pair it with a throwable weapon such as a dagger or a hand axe. Um, this results in a more reliable ranged DPR, however if you are optimized uh, for ranged weapons you could try and use this feature to really stretch stretch the DM and the imagination and action economy and everything. For example, you could cast Mage Hand, pick a blanket, throw, throw the blanket on the creature's head, with a bit of a luck, and probably begging the DM to just let you do it, right? Because that's ultimately what most of these maneuvers that go outside of the usual stuff that fighters and any other class does, uh, he or she, the DM, uh, could give you advantage because the enemy now has blanket all over his head and the enemy is effectively blinded from the cover that's covering his eyes or her eyes or its eyes. So thus your bonus action weapon attack is made with advantage and all of your allies attacks are also made with advantage because the creature is effectively blinded, right? So there is a million possibilities with this feature. Uh, I think only the sky is the limit, especially when you go into the cantrips like, I don't know, Mold Earth, m um, Minor Illusion, and, you know, like, with, without wasting too much time going go, talking about those. Yeah, basically, that's it. That's it for, for War Magic. I think it really offers some very, very interesting possibilities. Um, level 10 Eldritch Knight, Eldritch Strike feature, uh, few features in the game at all let you impose disadvantage on saving throws against your own spells. Um, now this feature does take you a while to set it off, but considering how Madness is one of the Eldritch Knight's weaknesses, meaning that you have to focus on intelligence um, as your spellcasting ability, uh, the ability used for your spells, um, this feature indeed, when you get it, helps circumvent, mitigate some of that uh, madness issues that you have. Uh, unfortunately, you cap out at level 4 spells uh, at level 19, and then uh, you don't really have even that many spell slots to work with, but you can still pull, you can still like pull off a, a nasty casting of like slow, or maybe hypnotic pattern or like spells such of like debuff spells that really hurt the enemy um, either completely incapacitate it like completely for the time being uh, put it out of combat or like severely severely hamper its abilities and uh, stuff like that so yeah basically uh, that's 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 the way I see it and I think this feature is very useful now arcane charge is again probably more useful for um, melee oriented Eldritch Knights but it can be just as good uh, for archery optimized Eldritch Knights looking to get out of enemy's grasp and continue plinking at it. I've actually seen the high level Eldritch Knight using this feature and every time he used action surge there was this situation where the teleport was actually really useful you know Getting up to a flying enemy for for the time being uh, Teleporting up to like um, a, a 20 30 feet high uh, Stone where the enemy spellcaster is at or whatever, you know like at those high levels features like this are Actually very very potent because if you have a half competent DM He's gonna use every opportunity to challenge you either through terrain or, uh, you know, like spells or stuff like that. So you just being able to have one more thing that you can do using your action surge. Yeah, that's like, that's gonna really help your action economy and your positioning and everything else you do. Um, so finally at level 18 you get improved war magic. So not only can you cast cantrips and then attack as your bonus action, you can now cast leveled spells. So... Think about this, a new enemy enters the fray, it's a big, scary enemy monster that hits hard. You take the attack action, you aim the this attack at the new foe, the new foe that just burst into the battlefield, you hit the foe, you hit the enemy with the first arrow, and you direct the remaining two arrows at the other enemy you've been fighting for the last three rounds. Then you use action surge and cast banishment on the creature you just hit. Due to your Eldritch Strike, 
The creature you just hit has disadvantage on the, on the saving throw. The creature probably gets banished. If the creature has legendary resistances, it's probably gonna use one of those legendary resistances. Then, to top it all off, you use your bonus action to finish off the enemy you just shot twice moments ago. In my opinion, no other fighter can be as effective as Eldritch Knight at high levels. It has just enough spellcasting to be relevant even in tier 4, while he does still maintain a high degree of single target damage per, per round, damage output, throughout the entire course of campaign. And honestly, I can't wait to play more of this class. I think it's really like a little bit of spells, a little bit of martial capabilities, just like a nice little mix of everything and uh, it meshes really well with each other. Uh, unfortunately, Purple Banner Knight doesn't come nearly <laughs> as close uh, to Eldritch Knights or Cavaliers or Battlemasters as, uh, as maybe you would wish for. It's one of those weird subclasses that got introduced in Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of almost as bad as Champion, but I mean, honestly, D&D is a team game. And at least it's more useful than champion to your allies and whatnot. So yeah, let's begin. Uh, first and foremost, there's a knighthood restriction. Right off the bat, restricting a subclass to a specific type of organization, to a specific type of character. Um, so frankly, it kind of like seems like a lazy design. Because by making it look exclusive, Wizards of the Coast only really managed to somehow make it even less interesting than it already is. It's just, you know, sure, okay, there is a knight in the title of this subclass, but there is also a knight in the title of Eldritch Knight, and it has nothing to do, there's no restrictions other than spellcasting restrictions, which, you know, makes sense, uh, because it's not a, it's, it's not a, like, full, it's a, like, one-third caster, it's not even half caster, so, yeah. But anyway, back to Purple Dragon Knight, I don't really like this, I mean, why would I be forced to be this, you know, whatever it is. Just give me options, you know, give me some options, don't restrict me right away, I hate that. Um, and uh, yeah, it might actually be good for somebody who doesn't really want to get bothered in figuring out what his character is, where he or she comes from, um, what does he do, what are his or her interests. Yeah, I mean, it could be good for those types of people who just get into a game like they, they don't really even get the full picture and comprehend all the possibilities. But even then, like, come on, stop restricting me. Fuck that. A rallying cry. I mean, extra healing is nice. Okay, I'm not gonna deny that. But one question asks itself. Should a fighter be the one who heals the rest of the party? I want you to answer me this question in comments, and uh, I'm, I'm really eager to hear your, hear your opinions. I'm not gonna say anything about it, because that might influence your answer. So, uh, yeah, there's that. Royal Envoy at level 7. Uh, expertise in persuasion as a fighter is a bit weird, but whatever. Uh, you... you know, the rest of these skills, Cavalier gets those at level 3, I think... I think uh, even Arcane Archer gets some of those at level 3, and I'm pretty certain Samurai gets those skills at level 3 as well. So explain to me why this particular subclass has to wait, wait 4 more levels to get pretty much like the same or similar selection of, 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 of skills that all of those other subclasses get at level 3. I don't know, like let me know in the comments, right? <laughs> One more answer, there we go, yeah, so... Yeah, anyway, um, Inspiring Surge at level 10, uh, alright, so this guy is clearly a team player. So I'm, I'm gonna yield to you that uh, the first thing that pops to my mind is a Paladin, for example, just waiting for that peculiar fighter, in this case you, Red Dragon, whatever, pur Purple Dragon Knight Banner, whatever the fucking name is, um, and uh, yeah, basically that, that y you as a fighter, you give it a Surge, and then that paladin gets um, a net 20 from a divination wizard. And then that paladin infuses the righteous, righteous fury 
of divine of fourth level divine smite into the pit fiend and then like deals a crap ton of damage sure that could work but give me cavaliers hold the line any day at least that feature works on its own is consistent doesn't require my teammates to, to like pull my own weight nah let me do something not just like having to rely so much on my teammates to do the work for me um granted some things can be made with this uh i'm not gonna deny i get a few ideas for like party compositions involving this particular subclass but that's 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 the extent of use usefulness i see with it on its own this subclass is pretty whack you know like it's not consistent at all like you you depend so much on your teammates and it could be like i don't know like there's it could be good it could be bad who knows uh bulwark okay well i think this one is actually legitimately good uh passing saving throws is the name of the game at high levels and giving your party members more opportunities to potentially pass their saves um is actually a net gain so I, I cannot hate on this feature, even though it's a fairly high level feature. But, I mean, yeah, sure, give it to me. Uh, inspiring Surge at level 18, instead of just giving uh, Surge to one creature. Um, yeah, you can give it to, I don't know, uh, two more creatures? That's what it says, yeah. Uh, honestly, give me Cavaliers potentially 20-30 attacks in a round. Uh, because I think that's better than two more attacks. Even though two more attacks are consistent but i mean come on level 18 should be something better than this um one thing though that banneret does have on its own is the consistency in the way of its fee of his features applied now that consistency may might vary wildly in terms of what's the actual output of those features what's the actual performance but at least those features work whenever you want them to work you know like every time you use your surge there you go you know like you you get two more actions from, from your allies so you know i'm not gonna say it's bad i think it's clearly better than champion because at least you can help your allies do something useful instead of like just rolling random one more damage die with champion at level 15 like, who cares but even then like Arcane Archer, I think, is still a better choice, even though it's kind of like worse than Battlemaster and Cavalier and Eldritch Knight. Finally, we have Samurai. I think this class is, uh, it holds well against Battlemaster, Cavalier and Eldritch Knight. Not really up to their level, in my opinion, but it's like almost right there. And in my opinion, again, I think it's still leaps and bounds above Champion. And clearly better than Purple Dragon Knight, because it's on its own, this class works really well. There's synergy in the way its higher level features interact with its lower level features, and that's what I like about Cavalier, and that's what I like about Samurai. So let's actually delve uh, uh, a little bit more into this. So, this is again another subclass that gets extra skills at level 3 instead of level 7. Looking at the Purple Dragon Knight again. Um, fighting spirit is the real juice, um, a very simple feature, um, which I'm still somewhat torn on. Uh, I've seen it in action and it was super juicy, however, the online West Marches sessions which I was participating in, they usually result in one massive combat encounter where you blow all you have and then go rest in the main headquarters until, until the next adventure. And maybe that's why this subclass is just the right choice for some people. I mean, personally, I don't think it would have been broken if it was two times per short rest instead of three times per long rest. But after all, like, barbarians get reckless attack advantage um, just like in exchange for getting hit a little bit more. Samurai still would have to spend like literally an hour to gain those two, per two, two uses back. I don't think that would break the class, but as it stands, I mean, it works. Uh, it's just three times per, per long rest, and at some point you get a bit more. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's good. I'm not going to deny I'm not going to deny that. Uh, so, at level 7, I don't really care about the charisma persuasion check. That's kind of like give or take. Uh, whatever, but the ability, like, the 
the fact that you get proficiency in wisdom saving throws now okay I, that's that's what i like um because wisdom save proficiency is one of those saving throw that even at lower levels starts getting used after like level three four five and then especially at later levels like wisdom saving throw is a very frequent occurrence in games and you being proficient in this particular saving throw yeah i mean give it to me um so tireless spirit at level 10 ties back to my argument why uh two per short rest fighting spirit uses uh wouldn't really be that much different than like th three per long rest uses of fighting spirit because if you kind of like do the maths and consider the most most frequent scenarios in most sessions campaigns games whatever it's really like yeah it's kind of like even the same but sure like at level 10 you get one more use of fighting spirit if you burn through all three uses before of them and this is this is good you know like every time you fight past level 10 you're gonna have at least one of these so i don't think it's that powerful that you have to wait 10 levels to get it but i mean you know it's good and maybe this is wizards of the cause way of balancing the class by giving it long rest feature that sort of always works you know well at least at level 10 it always works at least it works once in a fight so yeah i mean you do get that and i like it very much um rapid strike um this is the feature that clearly synergizes with fighting spirit because fighting spirit gives you advantage and then you throw that advantage out of the, the window you just you just don't even care about accuracy you just swing wildly and uh while getting more attacks is something that's not maybe that useful in a lot of situations sometimes you're like okay we need to finish this motherfucker now okay and then you know like you bet you place your bets and with like additional attack it just th that just might be enough for you to kill it or like i don't know send it into a unconscious condition or whatever um so yeah this actually might even be a reasonable trade-off feature especially if your dm gives you like a plus one or even plus two or plus three magic weapon yeah in that case we are really talking about this feature even like, even it even makes sense for you to like do it more often than just sometimes right so yeah basically that's it about ra rapid strike now finally strength before death um another feat another level 18 feature which i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna explain it like this so the way i see is this you are at for example five hit points monster swings deals 50 damage that drops you to zero but then you have this feature this feature lets you use extra turn which interrupts the current turn that the monster is using to you know kill you um but wait that's not all you were extra greedy with your resources uh you still have your second wind and you still have your action surge because you know you're an absolute maniac and you just you just wait until the better end to use those you take your turn you disengage using your action you action surge you use dash you move away you use your movement which was given to you by this like extra turn and now you are at least 60 feet away from the monster and then you top it all off by using your bonus action to second win and bring yourself above zero hit points so this is what happens you are at five hit points the monster swings at you you end at 19 or maybe even 30 hit points you are 60 feet away from the monster and it's like what what does it what what happens yeah like high level single class characters happen and like this feature this feature although situational i'm not gonna deny um but every time you're really fighting that really really f hard combat you're like everybody is dropping to zero hit points everybody is low uh casters have wasted their spell slots sometimes it's really up to marshals to do that last ditch effort to like squeeze in one or two more attacks and finish off the creature that you're fighting for like the last five or ten rounds and this feature alone can actually enable you to have that epic moment where you know like you get dropped to zero 
but you also drop a monster to zero so yeah it's kind of like a mutual knockout that you see sometimes in boxing in real life and uh, that's kind of like what this feature can allow you to do so yeah folks that's it uh, i managed to actually make this video one hour and 15 minutes shorter than i did it b before so yeah actually that's good i do have this messy word file which i wrote kind of like yesterday or two for the past two days i've been writing it um it's got a total of like more than 4.5k words um and i i've probably way over prepped for this video i could have just talked about this stuff off the top of my head but i think in that case i would be talking for another three hours on top of what i already talked about so i think this is probably a better way to do it uh if you want access to that thing uh, it's kind of like just a messy collection of my own thoughts which i used as a springboard of like talking points and stuff like that so i'm not even sure i'm gonna upload it to patreon but if in case i do and uh, in case i don't it, either way if you go to my patreon um that's where you can find the rest of my video notes and files now i already have like 49 50 videos on my channel not all of them are build videos or videos that have like these interesting topics most like some of them are just like announcements and stuff but considering the fact that again i'm gonna be releasing at least 49 more videos in the next 49 days uh this page is gonna get updated with way more stuff that it that it than it than it has right now so head over to my patreon for just 10 bucks a month you can get access to all of this and everything i release in the future I think it's a good deal, it will be especially good deal after I'm done with this challenge, which I'm definitely gonna finish. I have full faith in myself. Uh, links in the description, as always, like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button, you know the drill, not your first YouTube video, not probably the first video on this channel. Uh, more videos very soon, next video tomorrow, stay tuned, stay, uh, stay around, um, yeah, MinMax Munchkin out and talk to you soon.